For me, you know, the absolute seminal moment in the modern age of the Swing Armour was Peter in 97, so the Peter Snow's Exploding Buildings. And I remember saying to them, can we, can we not do Exploding Buildings, you know? And uh, they said, oh, God, no, we can't do that anymore. It's, you know, it's, you can't, these days, post 9-11, you can't have any buildings exploding. I was like, oh, OK, right, we're a bit limited then, aren't we? But, Peter, you know, the you funny should, thing is explain. all of those graphics, yeah, all of those graphics go back to David. That's the key thing, Peter, isn't it, yeah. really? Peter, well, just explain well, your what the exploding uh, thing, the exploding, <laughs> why you had exploding buildings in 1997. Exploding buildings were, were, were exploding constituencies. I mean, they were just people being beaten by the other guy. And so his house, his or her house, exploded. I mean, as simple as that. But uh, graphics, <laughs> I'm not sure. Jeremy's just said that David invented that. I mean, David invented swing. The great yes, thing about okay. Arnold Butler was he did two things. He invented swing to explain how he managed with two, three, four results to come up with a forecast of 650 results. That was the extraordinary thing. And the, the technique he had was to work out the plus, Tories plus so-and-so, Labour minus so-and-so, that was a swing of so-and-so. And that word, that single measure of swing allowed him to forecast all the seats. Uh, that was what he did. But I think on, on, on graphics, Matt, um, uh, yes, I mean, he, 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 yeah, he stood in front of a swingometer. Terrific. I think it was made of cardboard, I think. A wonderful thing. And Bob McKenzie at one stage had to add another sort of point of swing to get the number of Tories in the, in the, in the House of Commons. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, no, I think on graphics, Jeremy has invented magnificent graphics. And so did I. We had enormous fun with the graphics. Yeah, well, I don't think David was that keen on it. I think David was, was much more nerdish even than Jeremy. I mean, he was, he was deep <laughs> in it, but not having graphics so much. I suppose what I mean by that, sorry, Matt, is that is that I feel that he caught on to the idea that this very complicated story needed simple visual representation. That's all I really mean. Yeah. And that yeah. some and then and so the graphics all came out of that. But what's so interesting, Matt, is this, as Peter says, the idea of swing. And back in the day, amazingly, I think it was Gravesend he focused on. You take one seat, you look at the swing in that one seat. You paint it across the country and you get the result. Now, the problem is we couldn't, at a certain point, that didn't work anymore. And that's what's really interesting about the swing armature. It, it had to change. And that, that's the point, isn't it? Is that when you, had, when you had two parties, Labour and Conservatives, it was an easy calculation to make the swing between the two of them. And you could have, although it was on black and white TV, but you could have the two colours and the... And the, the, the piece of wood on a nail swinging between the two. But suddenly, over time, you've got the you know, Liberals and then the Lib Dems and then the SNP and things became uh, more complicated. Peter, when you were doing it and originally, with, how much were you being given information about what was happening and swing and all of that? And how much were you having to sort of work all that out? Well, the wonderful thing about, um, Jeremy, I'm sure will agree with this, the wonderful thing about the graphics is that they're all sort of, pushed by some machine behind the stage. So what I would simply do is say, let's have a look at the swing, not knowing what it is, not knowing what it was. <laughs> or let's have a look at the, the pluses and minuses of the shares of the vote, or let's see what the, you know, what, what so and so is saying, and uh, uh, what the figures are just showing us. And I would then press a button, which would bring on the next thing, which would show the swing. And I would say, oh, look at that. And I remember, I mean, can I tell you a small story? I mean, okay. Um, yes, Dudley yes. West, Dudley West by election, 1994. Dudley West by election, it was a record swing, 29% to Labour. John Major, total chaos in 1994. It was the sort of beginning of Tony Blair's great surge. And um, so I pressed the button. I said, let's look at the swing. And I pressed the button and it stuck. It couldn't, couldn't make, it couldn't make 29%. It was too much for it. And so uh, the, the whole screen went sort of blank and I had a terrible time. Um, and and uh, so I had to apologize to David and say, look, we'll get this sorted out. Um, <laughs> but but, but uh, it, it, the swing, we didn't know. I don't know whether Jeremy knows this. You, do, you don't know the great, wonderfully exciting things. Why well, it's the best job in television. I'm sure Jeremy will agree with you. You don't know what that picture is going to show next time you press the button. It's a complete surprise. Yeah. And so what you That's do true. have to I'm do, right. Yeah, it's gone, Jeremy, yes. No, I was, I was only going to say, your, your Dudley West story, I mean, you also had one 
in, in the States where I think you pressed it and it went wrong and, and the swing was shown as, you know, 200%. I had one in, in Scotland and this was, this was interesting where 2015, of course, I think that, you know, the Scottish vote in a way was a consolation for the SNP for the, the loss of the, the referendum on independence and it just went through the ceiling. And again, it broke the swingometer. But of course, that that's also hugely dramatic. And the, the, the incident that Peter referred to at the start was 1970. Edward Heath was was campaigning to be elected. He won election. And I, I seem to remember we've got a photo, Peter, of a man having to come in and paint extra numbers on. Because because <laughs> in those days, there was it wasn't done <laughs> digitally in any way whatsoever. That's right. It was Rob McKenzie. Rob McKenzie was standing there. Yeah, with but the guy with the paintbrush. Yeah, the, the paintbrush, paintbrush wasn't Rod. Rod. I think I think was, I'm not sure it was Robert or someone who came in. And they no, had to add on was... another thing. But let me tell you another quick story about Dudley West. Because it's, immediately David said, well, what would, what would happen in the national election if there was a swing like 29%? So I said, oh, we'll just have a look. So I, <laughs> I pressed my button that said forecast. And up came the House of Commons. And then it went black. It backed up. So I said, I said, what's going on? I said, we have these wonderful computer nerds, Matt, stuck behind the screen. And they are you know, very brilliant people who do all the pressing of you know, Microsoft or it's called computer version. Say that. And um, they, they would, I said, what's happened? And they said, well, the trouble is, there won't be any conservatives in the House of Commons if you do that. They won't see anything on the, on the opposition benches and it won't work unless we put some in. So I said, well, put one in. So they, they pressed one. <laughs> They pressed the button and they, and they, they put one in. And so I said to David, I said, David, I think we now have a forecast for you of what would happen if this lovely West 29% swing happened all over the country. I pressed my button, up came the House of Commons, up came the Tories, just one, only one Tory, and it was John Major. <laughs> <laughs> oh, John Major in Huntington, right. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking, well, we had this, I mean, I'm, I know we keep interrupting you, Matt, I'm so sorry, but we had this recently, Peter, where there was a poll um, of the Liz Truss government and they said that, and I think Labour was then 40, 37 points ahead. And then the <laughs> Times, I think, then said, um, and, they, you know, they said it with all the necessary caveats, but they said this would mean there were only three Conservative yeah. MPs in the House of Commons. Now, Matt and Peter and myself, of course, we're immediately going to look up which three they are. But we also, in the back of our minds, think they can't ever be only three. That's, that, that's, and that's, in a way, a sort of bastardization of the swingometer, isn't it? Because it, if you do it like that, you get a crazy answer. True. And actually, Jeremy, I was watching a clip of you, I think it was from 2015, where you had sort of four swingometers trying to take into account <laughs> Labour, Tory, Lib Dem, SNP... Yeah. Because those seats, you know, actually the swingometer probably only really works now, maybe England and Wales. Once you start bringing into Scotland, you know, thing, and there's no. the Red Wall, which is different to the South West. And suddenly True. it's not quite so uniform. But then, and of course, one of the things that I've learned doing the graphics, and I should have, I should have just gone to Peter about this originally, he would have told me, is that you don't make complicated things simple by explaining them. You make them more complicated. So mm -hmm. this is the fundamental misunderstanding is that we take this massively complex story and we explain it, it becomes simple. It doesn't. It's, so, it's that what happens is we understand the complexities of it. But I would disagree regarding Scotland. Scotland is very much. Yeah, you're right. The swingometer is left, right, you know, whatever. Um, it's, it works in two dimensions. Scotland is, a, is perfect territory for the swingometer now for obvious reasons. SNP versus Labour. The problem we ran into, and I know Peter had this a little bit in 2005, but particularly in 2010, is where you get three dimensional chess because you get the Lib Dems showing strongly. Yeah. And 2010 was the classic example where we it, it caused us a bit of a problem in England. And once you break down, region, we've done regional swingometers. It's a very long way away from the beauty of, <laughs> of the cardboard thing on a nail. And I, we've said every time we do a general election now, I say, look, let's bring back this. Let's have the bloody thing made of wood again as a tribute to David, because in the end, that's the joy of it. Let's keep it as simple as we can. A piece of wood on a nail. A yes, most I, fitting tribute. Yeah, I mean, I, I, the best one I ever saw was 1992. Uh, I mean, you've got one for one now, Jeremy. But in 1992, we had a, we had a socking great piece of metal stuck on a, a, sort of a hinge up the top of the screen. And, and you, I just moved this huge great thing, which I think now is purely oh. electronic, isn't it? You, you, don't, you don't get a great, a great. Yeah, camera. I remember and, it. 
No, that's right, pendulum. And this pendulum would, would go over the over the screen behind it. That would be electronic. And so the, the blue and the red MPs would turn, would change color as this great big pendulum moved across it. Great fun. But it's an excellent point Jeremy made about, 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 um, about being incomprehensible if they're too complicated. David Dimbleby, bless his cotton socks. Every every time I produced a new graphic, you know, sort of, we had a land, wonderful, wonderful graphic, it was a landslide result. <laughs> and the landslide would be a great heap of earth, which would sort of collapse into the screen. It's great fun. And out of it would come all the sort of surviving MPs. And um, and David Dimbleby would say, Peter, I have no idea what you're talking about. And so I would say, well, well let's see if I can fix it. So I would sort he of did that to you out. as well. Listen. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'll tell you, that's so funny. <laughs> I've got to show you this, right, guys, because I because I know that we're on the radio here, and I know this may not work, but this this is the picture I was just looking for. So this is the picture. Can can you see that? Of uh, just, it's, I think the screen yes. is too bright. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. This, so it's it's Robert McKenzie that I'm showing, but it's 1970, and a guy has turned up with a paintbrush. Oh, well done. Try. I'll see if I can. There we go. I so think there, more numbers. There yeah. he is with the paintbrush, right? This yeah, guy, yeah. and then Robert is watching him paint them on. So isn't that beautiful? Absolutely. Bring back the paintbrush. That's what I say. Something else. Because the cap came give it the best. Right, right. Just finally then, both of you, just uh, briefly, just sum up how you think David Butler will be remembered. Peter, first of all. Oh, as an absolute genius. I mean, he was the sort of, he was, he was the, the sort of, the, the, the grand vizier of, uh, of, of, of swing and he invented the word psephology, I think. Psephos being a pebble the Greeks used to chuck in a pot when they were voting. And uh, he was absolutely extraordinary with the figures. And and, and the great thing about David, as I almost said already, is this, that he, he invented this concept whereby you could forecast what would happen in all the seats by knowing the result in just one. Extraordinary. And Jeremy Vine, your, your, your memory of David Butler. I mean, he came in, I think, into the 2015 election studio and he looked, at it, he tried to disguise his sort of feeling of being, I think, quite appalled by the whole, you know, snazzery of the, the graphics now. He just said, I'd far rather it when it was made of cardboard. And he was right. You know, and I think for him, the, the, how will I remember him? I, I tell you what, I'll give you a personal memory. Um, as well as being a brilliant academic who gave us an amazing thing about broadcasting, he was a father of a person who was one of my um, BBC friends who I worked with a lot called Gareth Butler. And Gareth was born in the same month of the same year as me. And he died at the age of 42. And I think we, we forget sometimes when we remember somebody's life that I'm sure that was bigger for him than, than all of the polling he ever did. But I think he's someone who took joy from elections. And as I've got two teenage daughters and my dream is that one day they'll look at a general election and think, oh, great, let's get the TV on. And and David helped us think. Oh, there's there's a great night ahead, and that's the excitement. And and bless him, my hero Peter Snow. I've always thought enthusiasm and expertise are the two key qualities that Peter has, and David had them too. Well, blimey, we show you, yeah, we show you, Jeremy. Enthusiasm. I'm just I'm smaller word. Catching a few sparks from the master's <laughs> wheel. There is, of course, much more to uh, David Butler than just uh, the swingometer. And one person spent a lot of time with him on air and off air too on election nights is David Dimbleby, who joins me now. Um, David, first of all, your overriding memory of spending, I mean, long nights, an awful lot of nights with David Butler. <laughs> there were long nights, uh, uh, but he taught me a great deal about politics because he, he's, he's remembered as the kind of king of swing, but actually his passion was the democratic political process and how it worked, how people changed their votes and why and all that kind of thing. And he was always, he was a very good teacher. So I came in as a complete ingenue in the election in 1979. And he really taught me what I knew about elections and how the concept of swing worked and why it was interesting. And he was always... Um, he was always keen to explain and to listen to any, you know, objections you had to what he was saying and all that. He was, a, he was a proper teacher. And, of course, he did these wonderful, after each election, these great volumes about the election and how they'd panned out and why. Uh, that, and he did it just for British elections. But remember, he travelled all around the world doing elections as well. You know, the Indian elections, he was there explaining it. The Australian elections, the American elections... He was just fascinated by the democratic process and why people changed their minds and how that affected the government that was coming in. 
And it's not just the swingometer. The very idea of the BBC, as it was the only channel then, covering elections, results and campaigns, sort of came from him as well. And, you know, before you, your father, Richard Dimbleby, you know, we wouldn't have what we now see as a sort of, well, we can't have an election without election night and uh, and all of that. All of that sort of flowed from David Butler wanting to engage people in the political process. I remember the very first election he did for the BBC. There wasn't a swing amateur. Um, he had a slide rule and he'd, my father turned to him and said, he called him Butler, not that was a very old-fashioned way of doing it. Well, Butler, what do you make of this? And, you know, expect the Butler to come in with a tray of champagne, but it was David Butler. I mean, well, Butler, what do you make of this? And David just pulled out his thingometer and would say, well, if the country votes the same way as Sunderland has, the result will be so-and-so, you know. And it was a kind of magic, because nobody knew what on earth he was talking about or how he had discovered this. So he was like a sort of magician from the beginning, really. And then we got the concept of the swing and all that. And then he was passionate about it. I mean, I remember one election, not that I was presenting, my father was presenting it. So it must have been in the, in the early 60s or late 50s. Um, and he came back one evening and he said, I really cannot stand it any longer. The rows between Bob McKenzie, who was the Canadian political expert, and David Butler, they just go on and on and on. It's driving me completely mad. I had to walk out and say, you sort it out. I can't stand this any longer. So he was very, he was very passionate intellectually, you know, about, about what he was doing. Um, and he didn't suffer fools. But I suppose because he was treating, it was a science. It wasn't, you know, it, it, it wasn't an art he was doing. He was, he was producing a science in order to engage people. Otherwise, you just have this disparate collection of, numbers coming in from different parts of the country and what does it all mean and actually boiling it down and then turning it into a sort of spectator sport I suppose that's the thing you know it's, it's the reason that I'm weirdly nerdly over enthusiastic about politics is because of being able to read things into it and, and it's it's not just gut and what I feel about politics or what I might want to happen it's treating it as a I'm not really into football or cricket it's this is my sport if you like and that it's all thanks to you know david's passion really that it's fed, yes, fed, yes. fed to the years yes um i mean he what did he do he 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 had a sort of insight into the psychology of the electorate i suppose that's what it is and all this business about the cleverness of swing and his ability to tell from a very safe seat you know which wasn't going to change hands how the election would pan out because in that safe seat there'd been this shift of opinion between the two parties. All of that was um, the story that he wanted to tell. He wanted people to understand why we move from one party to another, not just to see it happening, not just like a magician to say, I predict a Tory majority of X or a Labour majority of Y or whatever it is. He, he wanted them to understand what it was that was happening. And I think, I tried to find this, I think he once told me, because I used to see him occasionally, and I actually gave a lecture about um, political interviewing and the coverage of elections on his 90th birthday at Nuffield College in Oxford. And I've got a feeling that he said there was a, a, a Victorian mathematician who first of all gave this idea of swing, who invented this idea of swing. I can't substantiate that. I'm sure you'll know, Matt, because you know much more than I do about politics. But far, it, far from it. <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a lay observer. I'm, a, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not in the loop of the mathematics, you know, in the way that um, Peter Snow is or Jeremy Vine is. I don't know. But yes, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> And yet, and of course, the other big thing that he pioneered was the exit poll, which lots of people th will hear your voice. And the, the, the thing that, will, you know, it's and it's a landslide or and it's we're out. It's you announcing the exit poll, which, amongst other things, I suppose, was a brilliant innovation when you're doing a TV election programme. Because it gives you something to talk about when you haven't got lots of results coming in. But hang on, did, did David Butler invent the exit poll? He, he first pioneered one in Gravesend. Yeah, I read. Yeah, he did one in Gravesend and from that predicted, I think, the... Oh, right. Da, 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 da. Uh, in 1970, he ran an exit poll and from that predicted the result. Uh, you see, I've always had a very jaundiced view about exit polls because, uh, first of all, because I remember 
one of the very early exit polls, which was a by-election in Eastbourne, after Ian Gow had been assassinated by the IRA, and everybody thought that it was inevitable there'd be a sympathy vote for the Conservatives in Eastbourne. And we had, in those days, we did our own polling, and uh, the sophologist who was doing it said, um, my goodness, the polling's showing a 5,000 Liberal Democrat victory in Eastbourne? I don't believe it. I don't think we can go on air and say that. Uh, we'll have to, we, we have to say something slightly more moderate. Let's, um, and there was a great argument. I said, well, you've done the exit poll. Why not use it? Oh, no, I, I, I don't think we can. It's just, it's, it can't be true. It can't be true. And um, when it, the result came in, and it was indeed a balotti for the Liberals with a majority of 5,000, there was egg on the face of the sophologist who said, oh, well, what we did was, where we went wrong was, we counted the people who said they wouldn't reply to our questions outside the polling booth, we counted them as conservative voters for no particular reason. We just thought <laughs> the conservatives were reluctant to say what they'd done. So I've always had been a bit wary about exit polls. And, um, and the other thing I've always thought about them, actually, is that I know they can't, you know, it's silly to say they can never be abolished now, but in a funny way, they do spoil the fun of election night. I'd much rather have had David Butler getting the first result in at, you know, midnight and saying, if this is the trend, then it looks as though it's going to be a victory for X or Y, rather than me stomping around in front of Big Ben and saying our exit poll says, um, you know, a majority for the Tories of this or for Labour of that, because it takes away all the fun. I mean, the fun of election night is the thing that David Butler first seized on, which is the actual results and what any one result tells you about what's likely to happen in the country as a whole. So, um, yes. And of course, we always got exit polls, but they were pretty rough and ready to start with. And IT, and in the end, we, we sort of banded together the, the big broadcasters so that if anyone got it wrong, everybody got it wrong. And that was, <laughs> that was thought to be, you know, more, more accurate information. And boy, we did get it wrong sometimes. And then there was a funny thing about them too. I think David had stopped doing it by then, but there was a, a poll went in for John Major in the, in the, um, in the late uh, 70s, wasn't it? Just before Blair, but Major's, Major, uh, John Major's election, when um, we thought that Kinnock um, might win. And we, we sort of said that we thought that Kinnock had a possibility of a majority or Major of being stuck, stuck with a hung parliament. And the Tories, because they were, you know, as often against the BBC, Thatcher had taught them to attack the BBC. And um, they said, oh, um, that typical BBC to think that Labour was going to win, as though it was in our interests to have an exit poll, <laughs> which would be found out within an hour, whether it was right or wrong. <laughs> sort of tip the balance in favour of Labour. I remember that. It was a weird, weird moment. Abiding memory I have of David, though, is the generosity uh, with which he would talk to anybody who asked him questions about election, whether it was in the studio, whether it was Nuffield College with his students, where he used to have senior politicians come and let their hair down about how politics worked. I mean, he was really fascinated by politics and uh, until his dying day wanted people to understand what it was that was going on because he thought that that was what democracy was about. So he was in that sense, you know, he was a great man. That's great.